Well, hi, folks. Okay, so look, look for me, I, I spend most of my life yeah. advising and training people on, <clears throat> pardon me, the design of their particular change project. Usually that's called a behaviour change project, where we're looking to get some people doing something they're not, they're not doing now. And, um, and for me, Diffusion of Innovations is it's, it's a bundle of ideas which are really valuable to inform my thinking. So, you know, it's not a mechanistic thing that you can use to determine someone's behaviour and make them do something, but it, it informs our thinking. You know, when we design a change project, we can get a lot of things wrong and still have a successful outcome. But if we get our thinking wrong, then it may be that we've really gone off on the wrong track. So the fusion of innovations, I call it a lens. It's a way of looking at a situation and it equips us to be good change makers. So just quickly to get into it, um, the thinking behind it is that innovation just means anything that's new to anyone. Uh, an idea, a practice, or a behaviour. My as example, my wife would say that for me, uh, not bringing home plastic bags from the supermarket would be an innovation, and that, that's all it means. It means it's something that some is new to someone, or that they're not doing now. It doesn't mean the latest billion-dollar gizmo, and diffusion just means spread. So it's a whole lot of thinking about the way that new ideas or practices or products spread through societies, and there's three bits of this body of knowledge that I found particularly useful for me. The first one, I call it buzzer networks, and that's, that's recognising how the communication that really matters is the one between me and my peers in my social networks, rather than what the agency tells me about something. And the second uh, body of knowledge is around the bell curve that many of you will be you know, uh, familiar with. And the third one is about design, about the qualities that help an innovation or a new practice spread. I'm just going to mention each of those today. Uh, the standard text is Everett Rogers, Diffusion of Innovations. It's rather thick, but it's very readable. So some of you might like to go and get yourselves a copy of it on Amazon. So just to start, the best way to start, oh, look, here's a little bit of research I did some time ago. I asked people in my workshops what influenced their changes in their lives. And they asked each person to think of a specific change, and we talked about what triggered it. And there you see the results. 29% thought it was some kind of information. 6% it was some kind of bad news, which is, I suppose, also a kind of information. But 75% of people said it was interaction with a significant other person in their lives was the trigger for change. And that's very consistent with what the fusion of innovation tells us. The best way for me to explain it to you is to tell you a story. And that's uh, how the diffusion of innovation body of knowledge first came into existence, which was way back in 1943, uh, in a nine-page plain English journal article by Ryan and Gross, who were two uh, rural sociologists, who noticed that in the preceding 10 years, virtually every farmer in, in middle America had adopted a new kind of agricultural innovation, which was, what they, what they, the, the change was that they had stopped um, the previously, farmers would harvest all their own corn, look at it, choose the best seed and plant it in the following year. That's the old method. The new method was they bought hybrid seed from an agribusiness, which you could only use for one year. You had to buy it again every year. So it's a massive change to their practice. And these two um, sociologists were struck by the fact that right through the years of the Great Depression, the last time you would expect uh, people, you know, risk averse farmers to adopt a new practice, it spread right through middle America, through the, the farm, the, the corn belt. And um, so they, they thought, well, let's go and ask the farmers what, what it was like, what was their experience. And they, here is this beautiful hand-drawn graph that, um, that they produced in their article. And, and you can see along the bottom are years, and up the side are the percentage of farmers who do something in a particular year. And the, uh, the orange bars are the number who first hear about the new corn seed in a given year. And you can see that you know, the maximum number in 1931 was 27% heard about it, and then there were fewer and fewer people left to hear about it. And then the black bars are the years when the farmers adopted it. And as you can see, eventually they all adopted it, but about 1% never adopted it. And so you know, as soon as you look at that, you can see that there's a gap between hearing and doing, which instantly suggests that hearing can't be causing directly doing, but hearing must be causing something in those communities, and that's causing doing. 
and in my workshops we usually have a good talk about that but what we realize that's what's going on in those communities is people are talking to each other the farmers are talking to each other they're observing they're, they're watching the practices of the first farmers to adopt it they're talking about them to each other and eventually they're figuring out how to manage their risks they're looking they're seeing benefits but they're also learning how to how they could apply the new technology how it could work for them what the risks could be like and how they can manage them and so that that really just goes to the heart of the the, the process of person-to-person -person communication along existing social networks is at the heart of so much of the adoption of change and the second beautiful hand-drawn graph that I want to point to is the one here on the right and I'll just quickly explain what these data sets are the first data set that's the one along the bottom that's just got a little 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 um, around about 1934 there's 10% there and then at that data set flat lines that data set represents the, the answer to the question to, to the farmers were asked to what do you attribute your adoption of the new corn seed and that data set there the one on the bottom is oh I, I, I attribute my change to reading about it in farm journals which is the principal form of impersonal communication that people had in those days nowadays it would be the, the internet or the news um, and now the, the second data sets the one that starts really high almost up at 70 percent and then declines dramatically and that's uh, I, I adopted the new corn seed because of interactions with door-to-door -door salesmen employed by agribusinesses and as you can see that was huge for the early adopters that really did drive change amongst early adopters but then it declines dramatically the third data set that starts low just about 10 percent and then eventually becomes dominant is I adopted new corn seed because of conversations with other farmers in my social networks and as you can see that's hugely influential not for early adopters they're really different to everyone else but for the majority of people they need to hear about it from people like themselves and then over here on the left is the BAS model and that's the coll a collection of lots of different um, data sets from different experiments and the idea there is that in the, the early stages of change um, it's early adopters very very happy to be influenced by you know reading about it in the newspaper or getting an information kit or seeing it on the internet but everyone else needs to have a personal conversation with someone like themselves now uh, I just I've mentioned this too this is quite interesting this is much more recent work this is a Framingham study it's a study of um, uh, a town in Framingham in Massachusetts where the entire population for the past 40 odd years have had very thorough health checkups as part of a long-running heart health project and um, they were also asked to uh, who they knew in the community and once this data was all digitized a few years ago they were able to produce these network maps of the whole community and you can see there every in this network map every dot's a person and every um, and in this particular case they, they were looking at body mass index so the size of the dots is the size of um, the people and uh, the yellow is officially obese now as soon as they looked at this data they could say hang on a minute it's in clusters people becoming obese in clusters and they did the maths and found that if you lived in that community and a friend of yours became obese your chances of becoming obese just went up 45 percent and not only that but your other friends chances went up 20 percent and their other friends chances went up 10 percent and they did the same kind of analysis for becoming happier and for quitting smoking so um, and you can just see in, in those data in, in those examples of you know my friend does it but that also not only influences me it influences my other friends it influences my other my other friends friends you can see how it's really traveling from person to person almost like a contagious disease I found this other lovely recent bit of data here a 19 a 2009 trial of the support for support from problem drinkers found that adding one person in recovery to the social networks of a newly detoxified drinker improved their chances of them staying sober for a year by 27 percent so how beautiful is that and once again it's yeah it's who you know it's who you know and the conversations you have with those people this is one of the very early studies in diffusion of innovations and it shows how 
there are some early adopters are very pivotal that people who like to talk about what they're doing early adopters are often like that and they're well connected and well informed and they become very influential for the behavior of other people and all of this of course is known as viral change that's a more recent buzzword for the same kind of thing and some people are well connected they're more influential than others in particular social networks what's our job so if our job if buzz is essential for change then one of the things we need to be doing as change makers is to be good at buzz making and in my workshops I spend a bit of time talking about the four four ways I can think of that we can be effective buzz makers one is by creating stories which are remarkable which are surprising which are liable to be shared between people the third one is is recruiting popular or respected people and asking them to do the buzzing for us the third one is with all the usual methods such as facilitated forums field days toolbox meetings and so on where we really get to facilitate people to talk to each other and the fourth one is is a whole bunch of fun ways that we just about the way we go about designing projects to make them buzzworthy and make them you know worth talking about for instance using you know out of the ordinary community art or having really good food or having them in unusual locations will get people to buzz so um, those are four ways which are available for us to get that buzz going on and just about the last thing I'll say before I stop the questions is this little study here it was quite interesting one that looked at uh, collected lots and lots of buzz stories that had gone viral and analyzed their emotional content and, and what's interesting is that highly viral content tended to encourage feelings of curiosity amazement interest astonishment and admiration all very positive things the kind of things that would cause people to want to tell a surprising or delightful story to each other but not bad news which is quite interesting so you know we often use bad news to communicate with people but it looks like it's positive news that makes a big difference especially positive news that's a bit out of the ordinary and any of you who really want to get into this, there's a great book on the subject called Made to Stick by Chip Heath, Chip Heath and Dan Heath. Um, and they've really looked at what causes stories to go viral and be shared. And I really, I'd really, i love to recommend that to all of you. Uh, now, I think that's probably my, my 10 minutes. Um, so, John, I think it could be time for questions. Indeed it is. And you're doing very well for time. Thanks, Les. So we've got a number of uh, oh, questions here. So the first one is, um, has modern technology changed the time it takes for action to commence or become commonplace, oh, sorry, yeah, to commence or become commonplace? Absolutely, it has. Um, look, I could show you another graph and it shows um, the adoption of, of uh, important 20th century gadgets such as radios, automobiles, mm. mobile phones and so on. And as the 20th century proceeded and communication media got denser, you can see the, the rate of adoption, the, the, the graphs increasing in um, steep really quite visibly. So absolutely, you know, imagine early 20th century people had very little, people had to just talk to other people and then the radio came along and after a while communication mediums are getting denser and denser so people hear about stuff more quickly and nowadays people hear about everything immediately. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it definitely is speeding up but keep in mind that, that what's involved is not just hearing about it, it's learning how to manage your risks. It's yep. not enough to hear. You've got to learn your way into how I do this thing and how do I do it safely, get the results without making any of myself or losing money. And that takes time. You know, if you're on the land, it really it's still going to take a few seasons for you to see what works, what another farmer does, and to see the, the crops grow and see the the the, the um the um the, the, the how how well they do in the, the local grain sales or cattle sales so you know there are yeah. re the, the real world still places limits on how fast change can occur but certainly simply in terms of hearing about stuff it's it's increased dramatically mm, good okay thanks Les um, so we'll need quick answers for the next few um, okay, so good, how do we know that that's okay um, so um, this one's to do with social media um, so you may be yeah. covering this shortly but how does today's trend for social media change all this is social media regarded as interpersonal communication uh, look I'll just say about this I social media you know, most people use social media to stay in contact with people who they've already met face to face 
So it's, it's, it has that function of holding together a social network and you know, increasing the density of communications between people. But so I, I don't believe so, there's any evidence that social media works very strongly to influence the behaviours of people who don't already know each other face to face. So I think social media is speeds things up and it's, it, it increases the density of information along networks of people who know each other, but it does not work very effectively between people who are strangers. And the reason for that is that you've got to trust someone in order to, for their experiences to influence your assessment of risk. And you can't trust someone you only know on a screen. You have to have met them person to person. Okay. Uh, you're talking about bigger people. Um, so how do we know that bigger people don't just mix and make friends with other bigger people? Say that again. Um, so I think it was to do with the social <laughs> network people. analysis type work. Yeah, so how do you know that the bigger people aren't just mixing and making friends with the other bigger people? Oh, you mean the VMI people? Oh yes. my God, how do I know? Or in, because in, well, in the beginning, they weren't. The whole community, virtually no one had high body mass index in these communities. And yep. so, uh, and so, yeah, in the beginning, the one person becomes large and they start to, and then another person who isn't large becomes large simply because they knew that person. So it, it can't be people, yeah, can't really work from, as it was suggested then. It really is people um, influencing new behaviours in the people they know. I hope that's an answer. Mm. Yep, that's good. Uh, and now just the last one for the moment. Uh, Liz, can you incentivise those network connections intentionally and productively? You mean can you use incentives? Yes. Uh, you, look, the incentives is a very, very complicated and vexed vexed area of, of psychology and um, the, the, one of the things incentive does is it does get people talking about things. It can get them excited. Oh, there's a competition. Oh, there's a prize. Oh, someone got this amazing amount of money. Oh, it's very interesting. So it, it causes conversation all by itself, irrespective of the, the effect of the incentive. So in that sense, it can actually, you know, look, I, I think it can make a difference. Um, it, it may also affect people's perception of the balance of risk. So when I know I can get a bit of funding to do something on my land, it can shift the balance of risk a little bit. But keep in mind, it doesn't change my assessment of the essential technology itself or the essential change. It must still work. If it doesn't work, mm -hmm. then all the incentivization in the world is going to make any difference. So assuming you've got a product or a practice that actually works for people, then incentives, yeah, sure. They, they, they definitely have add value to what you're doing. Okay, great. Thanks, Liz. Uh, and thanks to the audience for all the great questions. Um, but back to you for the second half of your presentation. Good. Okay. So I thought I might talk about the other two insights that I have drawn out of doing this. And the, the, the second one is about the bell curve. So there's the bell curve and there's all the usual bits that we're familiar with. Innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority and laggards. And one half of it, one way to think about that is that in, in, in fact, you could start by imagining who is the social network you're dealing with. Is it, is it just one street? Is it analysts? Is it one farming community? Is it a whole city? So within that network, put a little dotted line around it and say that's going to be my social network. Within that social network, the, it, it's amazing how often people form a bell curve around some new idea or practice. And one way to imagine it is that probably about 50% of them have a propensity to adopt. They're interested in it. And about 50% have a propensity to resist. One lovely way to, to look at it here is um, from a real life example. This is a study into the life be in it back in 1975, a big social research study of Australians' attitudes towards exercise. And this is quite nice. They, they, there are three categories right on the left-hand side. The super-toned young lions who are into all sports, the self-improvers who like to be fit and look good, and the tuned in and self-convinced. And together, those are about 22%. So you can, if you think about those people, you think, well, they don't need any convincing. They're right into physical activity and sport and self-convinced about it and love to talk about it. And then you've got 60% in the middle who are the drifters. And for them, 
sport exercise could never be about exercise. It would have to be about fun and enjoyment. And then you've got about 19% who are resistant because they've had some negative experience at some time exercise or sport has threatened or injured them. And so what is that? That's 22, 59, 19. And it's amazing how often roughly 20, 60, 20 turns out to be the rule. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's a hunch that it's a, a hunch that you, you always have to prove. But a good starting point hunch is if you're talking to 100 people in your neighbourhood, it's surprising how often it's liable to be 20, 60, 20 in their attitude towards a new practice. For example, if you're talking to people in your office and you come in with some new, new business practice, you'll probably get to 20% of people saying, oh, yeah, that seems like a good idea. Another 20% going, no, I will never do this and you can never make me. And then the 60% in between those. Now, uh, summarizing all sorts of different um, writings about what these mean and without making a, you know, you can write an essay about the meaning or what it means to be an early adopter or what it means to be a late majority. I've just put a couple of ideas here that I think capture the essence of what it means to be these different um, population segments. And by the way, they're not fixed. Um, a person can be an early majority about one practice in their lives and a laggard about another practice and an early adopter about another in their life. My wife would say I'm a, a laggard about you know, plastic bag use, for example, but I'm an early adopter of other things. So um, just thinking about it, uh, it, if you were talking to uh, an innovator, it would be fine to use a very visionary language. That's what they're looking for. They want to have a, that, they want to be transformative people in their world. They want to make a big difference. They spend a lot of time really developing their new innovation to spread it. They're very visionary people. Visionary language is appropriate for them. But let's say you've gone in a particular social network, you've gone beyond that tiny one or two innovators and you're talking to that 20% of early adopters, your language would be a bit different. You'd be talking about, oh, it's cool, it's progressive, it gives you an edge over other people. Not only would your language do that, not only would your language do that, but you, the product itself would have to give people an edge over everyone else. After you've got about 20% take up, you t they call that a chasm between early adopters and early majority and it can be a, quite difficult for innovations to, to jump over that chasm because the next 30% of the population, the early majority, for them, it, whatever the product or practice it is, it has to be reliable, proven, safe, convenient, low cost, no worries just plug it in and it works and all sorts of other very reasonable people tell you it's safe. So for, for them, the, the, the new practice can't be uh, an investment, which is what it was with early adopters. For them, it's very much a cost. And so reducing the cost and making things quick and safe and cheap is very important. Once you pass 50%, you're in the late majority. And for them, the chances are they don't even like your idea. They're not even in favour of it. They're they don't agree with the basic assumptions because they have a propensity to, to resist that idea. But one thing that we know we have to work with with late majority is that they don't want to be left behind and they want to fit in. So for them, we would, our language would be normal, essential. What we've all learnt, we can't live without. And of course, the product we offer would be, have to be something that was so simple and easy to use that, that, could, that, that they could easily fit it into their lives. And then you've got laggards, that often about 20% or even more of a population. And for them, it was a very high risk perception. Whatever you offered would have to be safe, certain, controllable, your free choice about how you use it. And as you can see there, these, these different segments of the curve give you very different languages and also help you think about the products. You've got to make people at every point. The thing that I... I love about the, the fusion of innovations is that although language matters, language addresses people in terms of you know what they're interested in, their, their needs, their needs are. The, the fusion of innovations is not about trying to change people, and it makes it very different from practically all the other theories of change. In the fusion of innovations, you don't change anyone; people just stay who they are. An early adopter stays an early adopter. A laggard stays a laggard. Instead. What, what's behind the theory is that it's our job to make products which suit those different categories. So we wouldn't just talk about a product being 
giving you an edge over the rest or being something that was extremely safe and controllable, we would have to make the product into one that did that, that really worked. So that person-to-person -person communication would verify that it was an easy to use product and it really did deliver results. The reason why it's worth really thinking about the different categories is that because for each one of our projects we only have limited time and resources, we can't deal with everyone at once. And so it's and strategically it makes sense for us to imagine we're only dealing with the next slice of the curve. So if we have say 20% take up as it is in this example here, the next target audience for our next year's effort is probably going to be the, only the next 10% of the population. And because we can see that those would be earlier, the early majority in this case, we're instantly getting, going back here, a little bit of guidance about the way we would have to address them and the kind of product we would have to produce for them. Reliable, proven, safe, convenient, low cost, plug and play. It would have to be that kind of product or they wouldn't be adopting it. So this theory, even though it's only a theory, you know, in, any, in every case, you've got to prove your hunches by going and doing a bit of research. Even though it's only a theory, it provides this lovely guidance for the kind of thinking that we use when we design a project. By the way, you know, where, where are people? Are they early adopters? Are they early majorities? Quite often there's research that's already out there that gives us some guidance. This is a study of the adoption of different behaviours by the population of Victoria. And you can see all these different environmental behaviours in this case listed here. Um, have floor insulation, use CFL globes, have gas hot water, and you can see where you are on the curve and instantly get a little bit of guidance about the way you would need, to, about who your next target audience is and how you would need to address them and what you'd need to produce for them. So that's, that's that second insight about the bell curve. And the third insight is about design about the qualities that we need to build into an innovation in order to ensure it's spread. And as I said before, the beautiful thing about it, diffusion innovations, it's not, we're not seeing our job as changing people, it's seeing our job as redesigning our products and ideas and behaviours so that they appeal to people and fit into their lives. Rogers uh, looked at a lot of studies in diffusion and determined that between 49 and 87 percent of the variation in the adoption of new products was due to five factors. Number one, relative advantage. Did the user think that the innovation worked better than the previous idea? That's probably the biggest one of all. If the, if the user thinks it works better, there's a very good chance they'll adopt it. And by the way, I found this lovely quote here from a catchment officer at South East Local Land Service who said, how quickly landholders can go from being sceptics to absolute converts when they see something works. And that really summarises that first idea. Does it work for people? The second one is combat compatibility with their existing values and practices. So do people have to go and rearrange their whole lives to adopt this product? Or do they have to adopt new personal values to to adopt the product, or it's an easy fit for their lives. The third idea is simplicity and ease of use. Well, that goes without saying. The fourth idea is trialability, which means can I have a go at it without really committing myself? Can I experiment with it and see how it works for me? And the third one is are the benefits observable? If someone else is doing it, can I see their benefits? Are they visible benefits? And those five factors are the ones that Roger thinks determine the adoptability of new products which is neat. And this plugs into the whole world of design. Now, I don't know how many of you have gotten into this lately, into design thinking or innovation thinking, but it is so exciting the way it is adding to the methodologies and thinking in the world of change. And um, design is about the way we redesign activity services and technologies to make them easier, simpler, cheaper, closer, easy to understand, give better results, and also to make them sexier and more desirable. And here's, a, here's ease here, one of the most important design principles of all. It's easy to use. That's my little boy there with his iPad. And uh, Apple advertised that as you already know how to use it. So whatever it is we're asking someone to do, can we make it like that? If we can, it's more likely that it will be adopt, adopted. Now, this is if you, if you go and Google design thinking, you'll see a whole world of really um, 
of approaches and thinking around the this treating the design of a behavior exactly as if, it, as if it's the design of a product. And this summarizes you know, the basic ideas in design thinking. Firstly, have we understood the user experience? Have we gone out and really talked to people about what it's like to use the current product, what's not working? Have we let them experiment with you know, new prototypes? How are they reacting to those prototypes? The second thing is, have we rethought the problem? Have we gone and have we identified a list of the minimum conditions for success? The third one is, have we blown our minds and got inspired by ideas from all over the world, all sorts of different approaches? You know, maybe could be from arts, could be from you know community engagement, it could be from you know, product design, it could be from anywhere. Have we really set our own minds as innovators before we start trying to think of new ideas? The fourth idea is just brainstorming. Um, do really creative brainstorming, and I've been having a lot of fun over the past few years finding ways to do really creative, imaginative brainstorming with people, so they generate solutions that actually surprise them. And then the the fifth step is make a model solution, often a few models, and see how they would work. And then build a prototype and test it. And then build another prototype and test it. And then improve it and build another one and improve it and build another one. And eventually, you'll have something that's ready to take public. And uh, that's, in a nutshell, that's design thinking at work. Especially, I especially love that idea of fast prototyping. Quickly make a prototype and get it out in the field and see how people respond to it. It's got to be the best way to learn. So, bringing all this together, if I was putting diffusion thinking into practice in a project I was doing, one thing I would be aiming to do is I would be co-designing and prototyping solutions that work from the user's perspective. I would involve groups of users in that wherever possible. I'd be aiming to deliver that relative advantage, ease, compatibility, etc. The second thing I'd be doing is, once I've got the product, I want to get the buzz going. So I would be finding lots of ways to facilitate conversations inside existing social networks. I wouldn't be designing messages and shooting them at people. I'd be bringing people together and giving them an excuse or a stimulation to talk about something. Or I'd be finding people who meet other people and getting them to do the talking for me. I'd be almost, almost thinking it would be around getting people to talk to each other rather than just thinking about me communicating with them. And what I probably wouldn't be doing is, I wouldn't be primarily relying on the traditional public relations methods like persuasion, education, awareness, or marketing. I would say my job is not to create the right message, my job is to create the right product and then give people a reason to buzz about it. So that's what I take away from Diffusion of Innovations. And as I say, it's, it's not the whole world, but it's a, um, it's a very valuable addition to our thinking and it's a lens to use when we're looking at problems and trying to come up with solutions. And that's my talk. Anyone wow, there? that's really good. Thanks, Les. You've been powering oh, through your slides there. Um, so we do have a bunch of questions, and we've got some uh, okay. time to cover them. But uh, short responses, please. So yes, yes, no answer. Good. Are the four yep. buzz making approaches a continuum? So does, does it start with remarkable stories and go all the way through to public events, or are they four separate things? They are all separate. Thought so. Thank is you. That short enough? Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, now, there's a couple here about uh, the correlation between so um, the degree of education and the rate of adoption. Well, look, the evidence, the, the research apparently is that the early adopters tend to be better educated. Um, they're more and more, they're better read. They, um, you know, for them, they, they've already probably heard about the innovation somewhere and they're just waiting for an excuse to start. So there does seem to be a relationship between education, or not so much education, but as, you know, um, well-readness or, or awareness of the world and things that are happening in your world that do make it easier for people to adopt change. So the answer is yes. Thank you. Great. Now, what's the relationship between adoption of innovations and socioeconomic status? So are more affluent groups of people better able to purchase innovations, leaving the less well-off people lagging behind in terms of uptake of new innovations? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, and that's, well, part of it is that, well, one aspect is that early adopters, it's quite interesting, the research, there's plenty of evidence that, that early adopters 
not only tend to be better read, but they're better off, they're more economically secure. And so for them, adopting the new thing actually isn't a risk. But but people are not so economically secure, then it is a risk. Absolutely. And, and that's why things like, you know, incentive programs and different kind of support mechanisms and mentoring and all sorts of work, that's very much our job to reduce the risk for people. You know, often people don't need convincing that an idea is a good idea, but they really need help to believe that they can manage their risks and pull it off. And it's, you know, John, you probably recall in our workshop, so much of the effort in designing an effective change project is mm -hmm. actually about helping people manage their risks and ensuring that for them it is not a high risk that they're, they're engaging in. Uh, having said that, I also want to mention a really great book, Everybody. This is a really good book called Scarcity. It's by two um, professors of economics. And one thing they point out, it's very beautiful, the psychology of scarcity, is that people who are pressured economically, you know, who um, you know, have to struggle every day running my farm or running my business or just surviving, they, they have, that reduces their cognitive space to engage in anything new. All new activities require quite a, quite a cognitive investment. And so people who are under economic pressure simply, you know, they have not got the cognitive space to make the investment. And that means, you know, once again, one of our roles is to help give people that space. Good. Uh, now we are running out of time, Liz. So just a quick comment. Um, Jamie has made a suggestion that um, a buzz tool that they're using at the moment is podcasts, and that they found them to be uh, an incredible asset for their farmers. So that's interesting. Oh, good. Um, and another one here was uh, to do with the Heath brothers. So they did another book called Switch. Let me just yeah, find it's that very question. Good. It is, and so they're wondering: Does the elephant, the elephant model, relate to what you've been talking about today? Now, the elephant model is is that to get change happening, you need the elephant and the rider both heading in the same direction. And the rider is the the, the prefrontal cortex that plans, and the elephant is the emotions to give you the energy for change. And I, I think it's a lovely model, and it, you know, I think it's consistent not just with, with this, but with everything. So yes, you've got to get people's emotions headed in the same direction as their, their as their um their planning brains. That's true. And, and um, that's very just much a quick question. Yes, it is. Um, do you consider that uh, innovators are positive deviants? So uh, objective driven rule breakers is uh, Philip's suggestion. <gasps> oh my God! Well, that that does seem to be one of the um that does seem quite consistent with the definition of an innovator. Mm. Yeah. A positive deviant, someone who's they have to be very <laughs> different to everyone else, or they would never have invested all their time and effort doing their crazy new idea. Excellent. Uh, and one of our uh, attendees has come in. Yeah, they've loved the scarcity book uh, and well recommended to oh, others. Um, yeah. And so, question: How do you develop fast prototypes in relation to social changes in ways that don't feel inauthentic, uh, almost like uh, productizing of social issues? Oh my God! Well, uh, look, a fast prototype has to be. So, uh, let's an example. Let's an example. The fast prototype is a prototype of your project. So, if your project is to go and hold a series of field days with farmers, don't spend three months planning them, but just go and do one next week. You know, ring up six mm -hmm. farmers you know and sit down and have a field day, and you know, whatever you're going to do, do with them. That's that's what fast prototyping means. It means just whatever your project was going to be. Don't wait months to roll it out and start learning your lessons, but see if you can learn it two weeks from now, and then learn your way in by starting really small. So that's the idea behind mm. fast prototyping. Excellent. And Les, can you just move your last slide, please? Because uh, one of our attendees is commenting that they're about to do some intensive workshops on uh, gardening for early adopters, and they're in the process of creating a network, um, and they're basically saying, any advice on how to move forward? And so my, my suggestion would be, you need to go to one of Les's workshops. The Changeology one was a really good one. But Les, do you want to just quickly tell us about some of the workshops that you well, do Well, folks, it just so happens that, that in October I'm running a series of workshops in Sydney and Melbourne. The first one is two days around Changeology, which is the whole thinking and also the whole, the whole you know, what are our processes, what are our practices if we're a person who's attempting to design a change project, which is quite an intense two days. And then there's also two days, one on facilitation skills, which is the giving people the basic groundwork of being an effective facilitator, and another day of I call facilitation zap, which is a whole day just immersed in all the really cool stuff that gets groups of people being innovative and creative. So that's a, a series of workshops that I'm running in October. And also I might point out my book. And um, 
you know, apart from the the Heath Brothers switch, I do think my book is one of the better books on um, um, the thinking behind how we design change projects. So I'd like to recommend that to you all as well.